Hello, my name is Melissa Craman. Today's date is Friday, April 5th, 2019. I'm inter interviewing Dr. Ann Kring on the Ball State campus as part of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. Thank you, Dr. Kring, for agreeing to participate in this effort, which we're conducting during the Honors College's 60th anniversary year. I'd like to begin by asking where and when you were born. Uh, I was born in Indianapolis in 1963. And what were your parents' names and occupations? Uh, my dad's name was uh, William. We went by Bill Kring, um, and he worked for uh, Detroit Diesel Allison General Motors um, as a manager of a plant, and Mother Mary Jane Kring uh, was a stay-at-home mom. And did you have any siblings? Two. Uh, older brother, Brian, uh, two years older. Older sister, Diane, four years older. Can you describe your childhood and upbringing? What was it like growing up in Indianapolis? I'd say it was pretty good um, up uh, to a point. So I uh, grew up first um, in, uh, I don't even know what area of town it would be, but in Pike Township, um, and uh, played a lot of sports in the backyard, uh, went to great schools. Um, the time I started uh, school there, I went to a school called Guyon Creek that was uh, testing out a new thing called open concept. So there weren't classrooms, it was all open, there were pods. Um, so kind of exciting learning uh, there. Um, so I uh, had rode my bike around the neighborhood, had um, you know great uh, idyllic um, childhood uh, up until um, when I was about nine or ten, uh, my mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and then died uh, when I was 11. So that was the end of that era that was so uh, idyllic. So our, my father um, was a single parent with three kids working full time and was not really sure how to uh, deal with that. Um, so he remarried fairly quickly. Uh, within the less than a year he was remarried to uh, another a woman who lived uh, in the neighborhood uh, who had two kids, so we were a, now a new family with five kids. Uh, we moved uh, to a different area, moved to Wayne Township, then in Indianapolis, um, and so then that's where I went uh, for junior high and high school um, in a completely different area, different neighborhood, uh, new friends. So it's always a little uprooting. I mean, it's a little challenging to be uprooted, but the death of a parent was uh, something that was difficult uh, to to go through. Fortunately, um, I had you know strong family still and, and good friends, particularly that I developed in high school, that uh, were invaluable for helping me navigate my way. What values did your parents instill in you? Well, uh, I think school was an important value, so they uh, wanted uh, all of us to do well in school. Um, and so from the time I was in first grade, I was selected to be in kind of a special thing for uh, readers. And I think I had an advantage being a y the youngest kid because I watched my brother and sister go to school and I, I really wanted to do that. And so I would practice being in school. So I think I benefited from being the youngest and was um, maybe ahead of, of some of the other kids. So I got all these special opportunities to do advanced things in school from a very early age and my parents really encouraged that. And then uh, I think they encouraged freedom uh, too. Uh, so this was an era where um, you came home from school, you did your homework, and then you got out of the house. <laughs> and you could do whatever you wanted. So you didn't uh, have play dates, or you didn't um, have to check in, or could I do that? You know, I just, we went outside, we knew we had to be home at a certain time. So that freedom, I think, to explore, um, coupled with school, was a really great uh, combination because it fostered imagination, um, helped me learn how to navigate, you know, just what at the time were serious uh, conflicts with kids, but they really weren't in retrospect, but it still helped uh, figure out, you know, how to navigate in the social world as well and explore and do things, uh, use the imagination, but still keeping school front of mind. You mentioned open concepts in um, middle school and into high school. What was that like? Was that an um, effective technique? It was actually in elementary school, the, the open concept. By the time I was in, um, in middle school, junior high, it was back to the more traditional classrooms, lockers. Uh, so it was, uh, I didn't have anything to compare it to. Uh, 
at the time, uh, I thought it was you know great. There was carpet. We were sitting on the floor. Um, you know, we could see the kids in the other classrooms because it was all open. Um, so, you know, I I thought it was was great. It wasn't until after the the death of my mother, where we moved to a different school district. Uh, that was when I was in sixth grade. I went back. Uh, I went I went into a more traditional classroom setting, uh, and that was very odd for me. So I had a semester of sixth grade where. I was in a classroom and I had to line up to go to the bathroom or I had to line up to, you know, and I just didn't, we didn't do anything in those other schools. So there are all these new rules and uh, it felt a little constraining. Um, so I guess looking back on it, the open concept part of it just uh, felt a little freer. And for high school, you attended Ben Davis High School in Indianapolis and graduated in 1982. So what kind of student were you? I know your parents instilled values of mm -hmm. education and you were already taking advanced classes in elementary school. So were you mm -hmm. taking advanced classes in high school as well? You know, when I was in high school, they weren't, they, that was before the day of AP classes. So, uh, so I don't know if I was taking advanced classes. I was taking um, uh, pretty advanced math classes for high school. So uh, I always uh, liked math and science. Um, and I was taking a lot of English, uh, but they weren't, necessarily advanced classes, although not every kid took calculus, I don't think, you know, so um, took a lot of Spanish uh, in high school, uh, too. Um, so I did well in high school. Uh, I, you know, got good grades. Uh, I remember, what I remember about high school was there it was a giant high school. I think there were, there were 711 uh, students in my graduating class in high school. The reason I remember 711 is because I was number 11 in uh, that class and uh, the top 10 uh, students in a graduating class got to sit in a special place at graduation and I was 11. I was like, oh, I was so close. Uh, so uh, that's how I remember that. But I did lots of things in high school too. I was in band, I uh, played sports, uh, I was uh, on the cross country team, uh, played basketball, played tennis, um, uh, was in the marching band for a year, uh, got to go to Hawaii, which was super cool. Um, and was in the concert band the rest of my time in, in high school. Um, had great friends that are still friends of mine today uh, that I uh, developed in high school. Um, what were your academic interests? What was your favorite subject in high school? I'd say it was probably uh, math, uh, partly because I had such good teachers uh, in math. Um, and I also liked English uh, a good bit, uh, like reading. I've always liked reading ever since I was a little kid, I guess. Backing up, that was another value that uh, my mother in particular instilled was just the importance of reading. Every holiday, I would always get a book, and uh, there was a lot of books in our house, and reading, um, something I did early, I would go to summer library programs and get medals for doing all sorts of reading, so, uh, so I think that's why I liked English so much. You were clearly involved in a lot throughout high school, so did you like to ambitiously try new things and kind of always extend your comfort zone? I I think I did. Uh, I, I don't know that I thought about it that at you know in that way at, at the time. I just uh, so I think it goes with the freedom that my dad continued to just um, instill. Uh, just you know if I wanted to do something, he wouldn't say, well, I don't know if you should do that or what about this. He just okay. So I just uh, never felt any barriers to trying things. I wanted. I, I like music. I thought, well, why not you know be in band? And I like sports. Uh, that I attribute to my brother who. Uh, taught me a lot about sports growing up, um, and uh, you know my dad's. Oh, sure, why not? You know, like uh, so. Uh, so I think, yeah, I I just did what I wanted to do, and and because I like to do it, yeah. What um, what did you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I wanted to when I was in elementary school. I wanted to be a writer. Uh, so uh, you know, I remember in fourth grade I wrote a, a novel. Uh, and it was a mystery, and I was always writing these little things um, as a kid, and I and I still have this at home too. One of the things I, I wrote about when I grow up, I want to be a writer. Uh, so that changed though by the time I got into junior high and, and high school. Um, I think uh, there I was you know more interested in math and science, so I thought I would probably uh, at at the time in high school I thought I might want to do medical school was kind of what I was thinking. Now, how did you view learning? Because most high schoolers kind of don't like learning and they view it as a chore, but you mm -hmm. were constantly reading and writing, so yeah. how did you view it? I always viewed it as a challenge, I think. Uh, even from elementary school, I can remember in math, we would, uh, and maybe this is the way I was taught, but we would have these little competitions um, 
uh, you'd get a you know a bunch of math problems and and whoever finished first you know raise your hand and uh, and so I viewed it always as a challenge um, and and a positive challenge um, so I I like that part of it I learning new things um, being curious um, it it I think came fairly easy to me so I wasn't frustrated by it but the challenge of it I think is what motivated me to to embrace learning new things, um, even if it did become difficult. And there were classes in high school that were difficult, but rather than be um, kind of put off by that, I just thought I have to, this is a bigger challenge, I've got to buckle down even more. Did you know about an honors education or what it was um, when you were in high school? Not really, no. Uh, I had great guidance counselors in high school. Um, uh, uh, two women who were just hilarious, and they, um, you know, they they helped shape, you know, my thinking about college. Um, but I don't think part of, that I recall anyway. The conversation was about an honors education. So moving on to pre-Ball State decisions, why did you want to come to Ball State? Well, the summer after my junior year in high school, uh, I had the uh, probably the guidance counselors who helped me do this, but I had the opportunity to come to Ball State um, during the summer and take a class. So there was a program that must have been for uh, not anybody. I don't remember how I, I got into this, but I came to Ball State, stayed in a dorm for uh, two weeks, took a class. Uh, the class was Introductory Psychology, taught by Arno Wittig, uh, who was very instrumental in the Honors College. And uh, I thought that was you know, fantastic. I'm not in college, but I was on campus. I'm living in a dorm. I'm doing college. I'm taking a college class. So, I loved the experience, I loved the campus, it was fun you know, to be here, and I, I loved the class, the psychology class was uh, amazing. I didn't have psychology, uh, it wasn't offered in high school, never heard of it, I didn't know what that was really, and he was such a fantastic teacher. He was hilarious, he was uh, somebody who was so excited about teaching, and he moved all over the classroom, and he did these experiments in class, it was just captivating. So. After that experience, I decided, you know, A, I want to go to Ball State, and B, I want to learn more and major in psychology. Uh, and then I, I did that. Uh, even, you know, I still had the medical school thing in the back of my head uh, a little bit, but, uh, but I just thought this psychology thing is pretty fascinating. I gotta, I gotta look into that. And how did you find out about the Honors College? That again, it was probably the guidance counselors. Um, so at the time I applied to college, I don't remember explicitly if I applied to the Honors College. I don't, I don't remember if I, or if I was selected for it, um, but, uh, but I know once I got here, I was in it. Um, and uh, so I don't re remember exactly how I got to be in it other than just coming here and starting to take from my first year some of these Honors classes. What were your expectations? What did you want to achieve in college? Um, I just was excited to keep learning, and, I, and particularly about psychology. I was really kind of on fire about what, what is this? I want to understand behavior. You know, why do people do the things they do? What's the human mind? I was just really uh, fascinated by that, and I was really excited about just living away from home and the whole college experience and learning you know, new things. This is kind of the step towards you know, my adult life. Uh, so I also had a friend uh, um, uh, from high school who um, was transferring to, to Ball State. She was ahead of me a year and she went to Anderson College and was transferring to Ball State. So I thought, oh, this is fun. We'll be in the same college together. My cousin, who was the same age as me, was also going to Ball State. So I thought, this is great. We're all in this, uh, you know, exciting new adventure. And actually coming to Ball State and you attended in 1982 through 1986, mm -hmm majoring in psychology and minoring in computer science. When did yes. you attach this minor of computer science? Uh, I think probably after my first year in college. Yeah, maybe sometime during my second year as best I can uh, recall. I, the reason I decided to minor in computer science was uh, based on, I began at the end of my uh, first year of college working in a psychology professor's uh, lab. Daryl Butler was the professor. And uh, he was a fairly new professor to Ball State at the time, and I, uh, he asked, hey, do you want to come and work in my lab? And I said, sure. I didn't know what that meant. But what it, did, what it meant was that he was doing all these interesting uh, experiments in visual perception and how we see the world. 
and uh, he was also um, very, he was a programmer, he knew computer programming. And the time that I was in college was right around the time personal computers were starting to be a thing. So this is when the Apple IIe, the Apple IIc, things you've never heard of, but you know, this was the pre-Mac era. Uh, those computers were out, people were having them. He had them uh, in his lab and he was programming and uh, he, he said, you know, I think these computers are really gonna take off you might want to look into uh, computer science as a minor. And so he was, of course, right, and, and I did. I liked math. You had to take some math to get into computer science. So I thought, that sounds great. I'll do it. Um, so took you know, more math, took computer science, uh, learned a bunch of languages that are now obsolete that nobody, uh, you know, well, some people in computer science know them, but nobody uses them anymore. But, uh, but it, was a, it was a great experience. And another, another friend of uh, mine from high school who came to Ball State was a major in computer science. Um, so I can remember this was when I was here doing computer science, we didn't have our own computers. Uh, so we would have to go to a computer lab and not like the computer labs that you have here now that are you know, just with all these uh, PCs or, or iMacs, they're uh, giant machines that we would have to go to and even the assembly language was something I learned that we had to type out on punch cards and run the punch cards through a machine to see if our program was right. And if you missed a comma or an extra space, you'd have to take all the cards out and do it all over again. Uh, so many late nights uh, working in a computer lab. So you would have taken classes in learning and cognition, motivation and emotion, personality, abnormal psychology. What was the highlight of these classes? Which one did you really fall in love with? You know, I loved them all. I took sensation and perception also that Daryl Butler, you know, I thought they were just all really, uh, you know, the ones I remember, I guess, you know, or, or maybe be the ones that stood out the most for me, but I loved them all. I remember loving them all when I was in them. Um, uh, so um, I, I have normal psychology, which is the study of mental illness, which is what I had later gone on to do. I thought was interesting, but it surprisingly maybe uh, wasn't my favorite uh, class. I was much more interested in the cognition I was interested in. Uh, motivation and emotion and perception because that, partly that's the research that I was working on uh, with with Daryl Butler um, and um, and and I was interested in the brain I kind of learning uh, about uh, early neuroscience as we knew it in the 80s um, one of the things that that Daryl Butler helped me do was to get a summer job I know I'm going off topic a little bit here but if you'll indulge me for a moment the first two uh, summers after college I went back to Indianapolis and I worked at Little Caesars Pizza <laughs> great experience for uh, how to interact with the world but uh, not very psychology related so he helped me get a job and I worked at a place in Indianapolis in the summers um, after that called the Center for Neuropsychological Rehabilitation which was a, um, a place that was dedicated to helping people who had uh, suffered brain injury of some type, whether it was by stroke or a motorcycle accident or some other traumatic brain injury, to help restore function. Um, so there was a lot of testing and there was a lot of occupational therapy, physical therapy, um, helping uh, group therapy to help people restore function. So I was hired uh, for those summer jobs not to work with the people with brain injuries so much, but as to develop a computer database. So I had these um, computer science skills that um, allowed me to get this job and I helped them develop their own database there with another college student from IU who was there. Um, but I also got to interact with the patients. I got to sit in, I got to learn about this. So that also fostered my interest in uh, the brain um, while I was still in, in college. So then coming back to Ball State, taking those classes um, really amplified my interest in what, what we would now call neuropsychology, the brain and uh, behavior. That's awesome experience. Um, so how did the Honors College classes enhance your understanding of psychology? You know, I, the Honors College classes, as you start taking, I mean, and I don't know if the curriculum has changed that much since, really, as I, as I look now what you do and, and what I did then. So we had this symposium the first year. Warren Vanderhill taught it. Um, it just taught us how to think uh, and how to think critically and about big ideas. Uh, we would be reading books, we'd be reading you know, New York Times articles, it was just a, a vast uh, array of different reading and grappling with um, ideas. We read a book by Studs Terkel and what does it mean and there was such conversation in these seminars and we were writing papers. 
I'm a college professor now, and the amount of writing I did as a college student is so much more and benefited me so much more than the students that I teach now do. I'm looking at myself thinking, gee, you know, you're doing your students a disservice. <laughs> so we would write these papers and, um, and have these conversations in class and read all this interesting stuff. Um, so the Honors College really, I think, taught me how to think. Um, and the, the whole humanity sequence, um, when, when I was here, uh, Ball State was on quarters. Um, and I know now they're uh, on semesters. So you know, for a whole year, instead of a year and a half, I had this uh, humanity sequence, which was an uh, English uh, series. I don't know how many books we read, an amazing number of books. And we were writing papers. Sometimes that was the class thing. You'd write the paper in class, a reaction paper just writing and writing and getting all sorts of feedback. So the honors experience, I think, taught me how to think and how to write, which those two things go hand in hand. You're not really gonna write if your thinking's not clearly. And, um, and a lot of the papers I would write would be about psychological themes, even though it was in a humanity sequence or even it was in a symposium about history. I was bringing in psychology into it. And I took an honors uh, biology class and I, uh, was reading about um, and writing about uh, genetics of schizophrenia. Um, so I was using the honors uh, seminars and linking them to what I was learning in psychology with the papers that I would write, but it was those honors classes, probably more so than the psychology classes really, that taught me the value of thinking critically um, and how to communicate your ideas and how to not um, be dismayed if you get critical feedback on a paper and how to improve it. Um, That's excellent that you were able to fuse those two fields to really leverage the mm -hmm. experience. Going back to your psychology major, what resources did you have to do labs or experiments other than just class? Yeah, they just working with this professor, Dale Butler, uh, you know, he had a lab, he had, he had uh, other undergraduates working with him. So uh, we were, you know, we were, I think, performing like graduate students, not knowing at the time what a graduate student did, but we were programming experiments. We were, um, we were running experiments. So we would bring other college students into the lab. They would do the experiments. We were doing the data analysis. I got to uh, present um, the findings at a national conference. I got to write up papers for publication all while I was an undergraduate um, with the, the mentorship of this uh, psychology professor. Um, so that was you know, a tremendous experience. And I did that really starting at the end of my first year of college all the way through uh, the fourth year. We traveled to um, the uh, Midwestern Psychological Association meeting in Chicago and got to present and see a, a meeting, um, what you know, professional meetings are like. It was, uh, you know, a really stellar experience that many students, you know, that, that I now as a college professor, they don't have that opportunity. So it was a, a great way to learn about research outside of the classes by actually doing it. Um, and, and the life of a, of a professor, you know, we got to see up close because he was working um, with, you know, the undergraduates as if we were graduate students. Um, it's a great uh, experience. How did your psychology major help you better understand the world and people? You know, it's a good question. It, uh, I mean, you're certainly learning about um, things like, you know, how behavior works, how behavior can be reinforced. I had a, you know, class that was all called Applied Behavior Analysis that was really just about the, the, the things that incentivize us to do things and things that, that we don't want to do. Um, it, um, it helped me see people in a different way. So some of the papers I would write in psychology classes were about people or politicians or people at the time uh, um, that you, you just learning about the way people behave, the way people interact with one another um, helped me to see the way people interact and, and to understand through a different lens, I guess, about when somebody is angry at you, it really isn't about you sometimes, it could be about them and that they've had you know, certain experiences in their life that have shaped their personality that contribute to how they uh, behave. Um, but I think the, in some ways the honors classes helped me see the world in a, in a more clear way than even the psychology classes because psychology were pretty focused on the topic of the course, but the, the honors courses were just so much broader um, and I could put psychology into those, but that, um, I can remember, I, I didn't remember, but I have it, because uh, I saved it for some reason, uh, in this humanities um, 
uh, sequence, we read uh, uh, Machiavelli and uh, The Prince, and I had written a paper about how Ronald Reagan, then the president at the time, was Machiavellian. <laughs> and uh, so I never would have done that in a psychology class, but that was you know, something that the honors humanities sequence um, you know, just allowed that kind of creative thinking. Uh, and Ronald Reagan was a popular president in Indiana at the time, but uh, the professor, I don't think, was a big fan, so he liked my paper. <laughs> And can you talk more about these um, discussion-based classes and how they affected you, um, maybe even more so than the lecture-based classes? Yeah, I was fortunate here that m most of the, uh, even the lecture-based classes weren't huge, you know, here uh, at Ball State. I don't, I don't know why uh, exactly, but uh, the but the the discussion-based classes were primarily the honors classes. Or once I got to be take some of the more advanced uh, psychology classes. Those were um, a little bit smaller and had discussion. But just to, you know, there, it was a space to air out your ideas in a way that was respected by the professor and the other students. Um, and, uh, the, you know, you were encouraged uh, to, to share your ideas. So it just, uh, it was a comfortable place to, to do it and you didn't have to worry about being criticized. Um, or uh, shut down. Um, so it was just really uh, something to look forward to. I think um, many people now, as I know, as a college professor, you know, don't go to class. Uh, why? Uh, well, that's on me. I'm the professor. You know, I got to make it interesting. But having that, you know, these lecture classes, you know, they can, you know, be difficult to engage with. But when you have those discussions um, about a topic, it really uh, it makes the class uh, and the material that you're grappling with um, just it's easier to engage with and it, it makes it um, so that you really want to be a part of, of what's happening in class rather than just listening to uh, the professor drone on and on and on. You said the Honors College helped you see the world in a more clearer way. Can you give some more examples of how it did that? I, um, you know, just I think uh, just by reading things that I never uh, otherwise would have been exposed to, thinking about ideas and in ways that I never would have been exposed to. I, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, grappling with things like I, I uh, remember um, just by uh, an honors biology class about ethics, you know, the ethics of biology and genetic testing. You know, I just, I never would have come into contact with those ideas had I not taken these classes and had the space to think about them in the discussion in the class and then through writing. Um, I think. Uh, so the, the way the classes were structured, um, because the, the uh, reading lists were long uh, and but important and varied, uh, the kinds of things that we read really exposed me to different ideas and then being able to discuss them and, and write about it. How deeply did you go into subjects with the Honors College? Because the goal of the liberal mm -hmm. education is to really dive deep to comprehensively and deeply understand a topic. So how deeply mm -hmm. did you explore those topics? Well, the, the ones that stand out were the, this kind of uh, honors symposium. It was really his, history uh, that, that Warren Vanderhill taught, but with a contemporary beat. So uh, it was more kind of contemporary American history and how society is changing. Um, so I think we went pretty, you know, for that was in 1983 probably or something, you know, when I was taking this class. So, um, so trying to understand, you know, recent past and how it, how we uh, see our current you know, situation through history uh, was just an enormously beneficial um, set of learning experiences to, you know, and I use even in my own work today to try to understand my field through a historical lens, I think, uh, came from, from that class. And then just the, uh, the humanities uh, English uh, sequence, um, I, I remember at the end of the class, the professor uh, Brown gave us a, a reading list, and he was always kind of funny, uh, joking about you know how we wanted to just read contemporary fiction, but these are the classics, and you should take them. And I know the stuff you're reading is drivel, and but this is what you should really devote your time to. He would do it in a funny way, um, and uh, and and then I would later you know in in my life you know look at that list and and read some of those things. So just the breadth of reading, um, and it wasn't just uh, it was fiction, nonfiction. We read a lot of poetry you know, throughout the course of time in that class, I think went pretty, pretty deep too. Um, and then the, you know, the bioethics and genetics class was a pretty deep dive into that subject at the time, you know, long before we had decoded the human genome. Um, but yet people were still, you know, looking ahead to think that someday we're going to be able to really identify genes 
that are associated with disease and what do we want to do about that. Uh, and did that spark any interest in you wanting to really delve deeper into the clinical part of psychology? You know, it did in the class, but I really didn't get to that, you know, till I was already in graduate school. I didn't even go to graduate school really uh, to uh, be uh, interested in clinical psychology. I was interested in neuropsychology in the brain, but I wasn't interested in severe mental illness when I started graduate school, yeah. Moving on to your professors, the most notable ones you noted were Dr. Warren Vanderhill, who taught an introductory seminar course. Can you talk about this course? That was just uh, the, the one that I mentioned that was a kind of the historical lens on contemporary society. Um, we, uh, you know, we wrote papers uh, in, in that class, um, personal experiences through a historical lens, uh, and we read widely different, you know, articles. So that was a great one, yep. Uh, and your English professor, Dr. Brown, who yeah. you said genuinely cared about his students and instilled a love of literature in you. Yes. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a love of reading before, but, you know, he uh, definitely, uh, he definitely instilled the broader uh, love of, of literature. So I was always, still I am reading, you know, a lot of mysteries because uh, I like the puzzles uh, in them, but, you know, he just opened a, a much broader uh, array of things to read. Um, so that, you know, I still read, you know, 50 books a year probably um, that aren't, you know, work-based uh, um, and that I trace back to that time here, yeah. And Dr. Don Mechshells, you also mentioned, what did he teach and how did he influence you? I don't, Don Mechshell, uh, I don't know if he actually taught anything. He was, uh, or if he did, I don't remember. He was, um, I was an Emmons Scholar, I had, uh, I was part of the Emmons Scholar program and so he was the, in charge of the Emmons Scholar program. So he was kind of an informal advisor and we would get together with all the Emmons Scholars. Um, so I don't remember if he taught anything uh, that I took. Uh, but uh, Arno Wittig, the, the guy that got me into psychology um, in the first place when I was still in high school, and uh, I took other classes with him. He was a great uh, professor. And Daryl Butler, um, uh, also great psychology professor who got me involved in research and really kind of set me on the trajectory of wanting a career in, in research. Did you feel you were held to much higher expectations as an honors college student? I don't think I felt that, no, at the time, no. I think I had pretty high expectations for myself. Um, and, you know, part of, you know, learning for me is still always the challenge. I always wanted to do well. Um, so I didn't necessarily, I think the, the, uh, the courses themselves were challenging and demanding. Um, so the expectations of those courses were higher, I think, than in some other classes. Um, but for me, uh, I thought that was, you know, terrific. Uh, I, I really liked that um, and it helped um, me uh, uh, rise to the challenge in those, in those classes. And moving on to your student organization. So you were the president of Alpha Lambda Delta, which was a freshman honor society. Mm -hmm. So how did being in the honors college relate to you wanting to be the president of an honors society of intellectual mm -hmm. beings who were pursuing ambitious things? I think just because it was the love of learning and the love of, um, uh, yeah, I think that was, you know, love, the love of learning and doing well uh, academically. That was, you know, something that I was uh, doing and I wanted to encourage other people to do that and uh, reward it um, and uh, also show that learning is, you know, uh, what, what I tried to do for with Alpha Lambda Delta was try to make it fun, you know, so that sometimes, you know, learning, oh, those smart kids, you know, that's just boring. All they do is spend their time in a book. But we did a lot of social activities and I tried to, you know, help, uh, you know, learning. Yes, you got to put the time in to, to do well, but, you know, you can also have fun. Uh, and what did you learn being in this leadership position? Uh, you know, I think I just, I mean, it was a great experience to, uh, uh, to, learn how to lead a group, how to call a meeting, and then nobody comes. Well, what you, well this is long before we had email, too. Uh, so, you know, communicating, you know, your message. Um, hey, we're going to have a meeting. Well, why should I come to that? Talking about the importance of what we're going to cover, how to make it, you know, kind of fun. So make it, you know, social. Um, so communication, setting agendas, running, you know, meetings, creating a vision for, you know, what can we do with our group? What do we want to do here? Uh, so. All of those, I think, were great lessons that I learned um, uh, with, with that and other groups here. You earned the Emmons Scholarship, so what mm -hmm. was the program for that like? Uh, you know, it was a great honor uh, to be, you know, have a scholarship named after uh, Emmons, and at the time I was here, um, 
Dr. Emmons' wife, Aileen Emmons, was still alive, so we would meet once a year with her and have lunch um, and, and just hear about her family um, and you know the Emmons legacy on this campus. And it was also another cohort of, I think there are probably eight to 10 of us uh, in a cohort, so it was another social group. Um, they weren't the people that I really uh, hung out with, I don't think, you know, on college, but we would still, we had that shared commonality um, uh, and getting together for these uh, Emmons events throughout the year. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a, yeah, I still get uh, from the Emmons children, they send out a letter every year um, to, uh, to me and to former Emmons scholars. Here's the new list of students, so it's fun to keep up with uh, all the people that are still in the Emmons program. Now I'd love to talk about you being selected by Dr. Arno Whitting for the National mm -hmm. Honors Conference in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. in which you um, gave a workshop about the fellowships for undergraduates and honors experience. So can you talk about this awesome experience? It was awesome. I'd never been to Salt Lake City before. I'd hardly barely ever been on a plane before. Uh, so <laughs> it was uh, a great experience to be selected and to be able to go uh, to Salt Lake City. It was a beautiful city. I still think it's one of the cleanest cities in the world. Uh, and uh, to participate in, a, in, a, in this conference and to talk about my experience uh, and with him, uh, you know, the honors experience um, uh, and what we were doing on this campus and sharing it with other people, uh, it was great. Uh, we also went to a Utah Jazz basketball game, which was <laughs> fun. Um, so yeah, I was, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. So you were talking about the honors program to a lot of people who may not have known, known about it. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the hallmarks that you were really promoting to people? I don't really remember, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I hope it worked though because <laughs> Ball State's onto something, you know, good here. Uh, so I hope, uh, I hope other campuses are, are trying to at least get close to the level that Ball State has. And were you involved in the undergraduate fellows program? No, I don't think so. Okay, no. and you were also involved in the Psy Chi Psychology yeah. mm -hmm. Honor Society. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that? Yeah, that was another, yeah, that's a, an honors uh, society. Uh, it's a national organization that's been around since, I don't know, the early 1900s uh, for, uh, you have to achieve a certain GPA. I think it's like a 3.5 or something. Um, so uh, we had a lot of psychology majors that were in Psychi. I was a president of uh, Psychi. We had an annual banquet um, uh, where uh, Psychi, uh, uh, new uh, inductees would be inducted into the chapter of Psychi. The faculty would all come. So. It was uh, really a big deal, I think, in, for psychology majors to have this little banquet. Um, I mean, it was probably, I don't remember where it was. I remember it was probably on campus, but it felt like a big deal. You know, everybody dressed up, and, and so, um, you know, I had to give a, a little speech, you know, and, uh, uh, in front of all the faculty, and we would have the induction for the new uh, Psychi members. So, um, so it was another opportunity for people who are doing well academically, but to get together, and it was mostly a social group. Uh, and do you remember being part of the University Senate? There was um, a Ball State Daily News article that discussed you were taking notes about the termination of tenured faculty. So what was your involvement like on the University Senate? I have no memory of that. Good, good research, yeah. So. Well, that's another I, great thing I that hope you were involved I was, in. I hope I was against uh, terminating tenure, <laughs> speaking as a college professor now. <laughs> And how did your involvement in these clubs help you inside the class and help you with different mm -hmm. leadership skills and critical thinking? Um, I don't know if it helped me inside the class. I think it just helped me have a much uh, kind of fuller college experience um, by doing other things. Um, so yeah, I've also played a lot of intramural sports here. Um, so yeah, I think, it just, um, I think it just helped me do a lot of different things, which is always a good thing, I think, for college students not to only do you know studying but to do other things yeah and you were housed in Botsford Swinford correct Schmidt Schmidt Wilson. oh Schmidt yeah so that yeah. was um, a dorm with was it only psychology majors no it wasn't like that at all uh, like I know now it seems like dorms are like now I think it's like theater or something it's over there so I think um, I think th at that time most honor students were in Botsford Swinford but um, uh, I wasn't, uh, they must have run out of space or something, so I was in Schmidt, Wilson, but I was in the Schmidt, the lower part of it. Um, yeah, and I stayed there for three years. So I don't know, there weren't too many other honors college students around the people that I was, my uh, roommates and other people that I was hanging out with in the dorm. Uh, honors college wasn't what we shared. Uh, and in the classroom, you, when you were with honors college students, do you felt they brought a diverse set of ide ideologies and backgrounds? 
Uh, that's a good question. I think the discussion certainly did. That may have been driven more by the professor to get us to think differently about things. My recollection is that we were mostly kids from Indiana, you know, who uh, grew up in Indiana. And so um, most people at that time growing up in Indiana didn't have a lot of diverse experiences. Now, in a January edition of Playboy magazine, Ball State is listed at number 18 on the top 40 party colleges, citing that <laughs> it may be small, but it boasts a guy-to-girl <laughs> ratio that men love. So did you kind of uh, recognize this obsession with partying um, outside of the Honors College or even yeah. within the Honors College with students? No. Yeah, probably because I was not a uh, partier myself. So yeah, no, I didn't. And there were things that were in the dorms, you know, but those were always like awkward. It felt a little bit like junior high. They would try to have social events in there and they just were always a, a big thud. I stopped going to those. So yeah, no, that was not, yeah, I did not notice that. And do you feel the Honors College offered you classes that you would have never taken otherwise? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. What classes like this? All of them. I, I don't think I would have taken any of those. I mean, I probably would have taken English you know, classes, but I wouldn't have had that same kind of experience um, for sure, yeah. And what new passions did these classes instill in you outside of psychology and literature? Mm -hmm. Was there any other subjects that you really kind of tried to pursue an independent study of just because you were so fascinated with how the teacher taught it? I don't think I did that, no, while I was here, uh, no, but I think they just the, um, you know, my interest in history and just taking a historical lens came from that and I, you know, continue to be interested in that. Um, so, but I don't think it, that led to uh, any more intensive study of different subjects while I was here. Now we'll move on to your Honors College thesis in 1985, which is the potential non-local features in depicted mm -hmm. three-dimensional objects. And your thesis director was Daryl Butler, which is Associate mm -hmm. Professor of Psychological Science. And it was about form perception, different elements like closure, regularity, and parallelism, um, and how that influences mm -hmm. people's perception. So mm -hmm. this kind of relates back to the experiences you had before recognizing people's sight and their perceptions. So that was probably the reason why you wanted to do yeah. this honors yeah. college thesis. Yeah. Um, can you talk about more about what you had to do with this thesis? I know you did some mm -hmm. experimentation with Ball State right. students. Right, we did. Yes, yeah, so we programmed uh, experiments, which was a great experience. You know, using my programming skills, and I can't illustrate this, um, otherwise I would draw it. But we were using what's called a Necker cube. You probably know what it is, but it's like basically two squares on top of each other, and if you look at these, sometimes it looks like this is the front and then uh, another time uh, it looks like this is the front. It kind of, while you're watching it, what looks like the front because it, you're making a two-dimensional depiction of a three-dimensional cube. So we were looking at those cubes and then we were uh, rotating them like 90 degrees or how far could you move that and bend the line. So it looks like the lines were bent so you still, you didn't, you, this is 90 degrees, so you didn't no longer have a 90 degree angle. So that's what we were doing, um, I can't at all remember what we found, <laughs> how much you rotated it, but it was still just super fascinating that I could program this and I could you know, make these things move and then people would come in and look at them and they would make a judgment about what they saw and then I would analyze the data. So um, that, that's what I remember, not so much what we found, um, but that you know, I thought it was pretty interesting. So reflecting about the Honors College, you're in your senior year, what was one of the things that you looked back on and was really a highlight of the entire experience, whether it be a professor or a class or an activity? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the probably, I mean, the research experience I got in psychology was, uh, you know, really uh, foundational for everything I've done uh, since then. But then all of those classes, and the, as best I can remember, I took those really kind of in the first couple of years that, uh, uh, initial symposium and then that honor sequence I think were in my second year of college. Um, those I think set the stage for success in everything else I did including computer science which was not at all part of the honors college by just um, by just uh, helping me see I could succeed at this very difficult college level stuff that we were doing in these honors classes um, no matter how difficult you know computer science was. And in 1987, you jumped into the American Psychological Association. So why did you want to become involved right out of college? Well, I was in graduate school at that point. Uh, so uh, I started graduate school in the fall of 1986. And so that's uh, kind of what we were um, 
all mentored to do. You know, you're this part of becoming a professional psychologist, join the professional uh, association. So I did, yeah. And from 86 to 89, like you said, you were mm -hmm. in graduate school at the State University of New York at Stony Brook with a focus and concentration in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. So why did you want to go on to grad school? Well, I was wanting to go to graduate school to study neuropsychology. I was really, uh, I wanted to keep up in psychology and then working at that Center for Neuropsychological Rehabilitation was such a tremendous experience. I really wanted to understand the brain and behavior when there's damage to the brain, how can we restore function? So. I, I went off to graduate school thinking that uh, I could do neuropsychology, um, and I did that largely on the advice of a fellow, uh, somebody who was already in graduate school at Stony Brook, um, but turned out once I got there, they weren't really doing neuropsychology. So um, I, I also decided to go to Stony Brook um, largely because I was ready to move out of Indiana. I wanted to see you know <laughs> something, uh, something different. Um, so I said, New York is gonna be different. So. Uh, so I got to graduate school thinking I would do neuropsychology, uh, couldn't because there wasn't anybody doing that there. So I had to kind of scramble around and find a different advisor. There was uh, another faculty member there who was doing research in schizophrenia. And I thought, ooh, you know, I, didn't, I don't want anything to do with severe mental illness. That's too scary and, and people never get better. It'd be too depressing. I, but, I, but I have to do something and there's probably something wrong with the brain in schizophrenia. So. I guess I could do maybe neuropsychology of, of schizophrenia. So I, I switched faculty advisors to this guy, John Neal, in graduate school and started to read articles about schizophrenia, thinking I would just you know do neuropsychology of schizophrenia and then move on. But then uh, I became fascinated by schizophrenia um, and I you know did spent the rest of my graduate career doing work in schizophrenia and the rest of my career has been really research uh, in schizophrenia. So had no idea when I went to graduate school that's what I would end up doing. Um, certainly what I thought I wouldn't do, but that's actually what I ended up doing. That's fascinating. And in 1990 to 91, you were an intern at Bellevue Hospital Center and Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center in New York. So what did you do here? So because I was in a clinical psychology program, part of getting a PhD in clinical psychology requires you do a year-long internship uh, somewhere. So that was my internship year. So I was at Bellevue uh, Hospital in, in New York, um, in Manhattan. Um, and so what I was doing there, I was working different rotations uh, in the hospital. I worked on a, a unit with severe mental illness. Um, I worked uh, with, with people with severe mental illness. Um, I worked on a, a rotation where we worked with family members who had someone who had suffered a severe mental illness. Um, and then the Kirby Forensic Psychiatric Center piece of it was um, two days a week during my internship year, I worked at this forensic hospital also in New York. Um, uh, and that was a place for uh, people with severe mental illness who had also been found uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. So they had committed a crime. Um, but they were found not responsible for that crime because of a severe mental illness. So instead of going to prison, they would go to this hospital um, and uh, the goal of the hospital was to treat them um, so that they were no longer dangerous and no longer mentally ill. Um, so there I was working again with people with severe mental illness, but in a much different setting. Um, so it wasn't a prison, but yet it wasn't like a, 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 a setting where people could freely move about. The, the wards were locked, there were bars on the windows, there was uh, some you know security uh, you know people there, um, so that was uh, also a tremendous experience. And would you say that kind of set the trajectory for you wanting to do career work with mental illness? Yeah, and the research that I was doing yeah in graduate school before I got to the internship, yes, I think both of those things combined. Yeah, I was on that path. I was you know fascinated by schizophrenia. I, I really wanted to understand it. Uh, Better, I wanted to try to make a difference in the lives of uh, people uh, who have this illness that can really rob somebody of, of everything about them that, that uh, makes them human. Uh, so I was really committed to sticking with that, yeah. And in 91, you earned your PhD from, again, the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And did, do you think Ball State prepared you well for graduate school? Completely, yes. I mean, this, that. Uh, that I was able to take so many psychology classes and that I was involved in research from the time I was a first year student, because really graduate school was all about research. So uh, I, um, you know, I, I had like a mini tutorial in graduate school but as an undergraduate here um, by getting all that research experience. Absolutely helped me. Yeah. That's great. And what about experimentation? So you said research, which obviously that encompasses experimentation, but how exactly did those 
um, experiences from the Honors College carry over to your graduate studies? Uh, well, I knew, you know, what experiments were. I knew, you know, how to design them. I knew uh, my computer programming skills uh, came, you know, in, uh, in, were enormously valuable. So when I got to graduate school, we were um, uh, setting, me and another uh, graduate student were setting up a lab to um, record psychophysiology, which is c recording um, how your body responds uh, to uh, different emotionally evocative situations. So we were measuring your uh, heart rate or um, how much your palms sweat. And so uh, we had to get all this equipment. We had to learn you know, about amplifiers and electronics, and then we had to program it to work you know, and get the data. And so all of uh, the computer programming skills that I had at Ball State helped me uh, do that. Um, as well as um, just understanding how to uh, design experiments, how to get people in, how to analyze the data. Um, I had that kind of foundational work here that helped me uh, along with the classes I took in graduate school. And from 1991 to 1998, you were the assistant professor at Vanderbilt University. So why Vanderbilt? Uh, you know, I, I w uh, applied for jobs, and I uh, was fortunate to get interviews at a, a lot of different places. Um, and um, I had kind of narrowed my choices down to um, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, University of Georgia, and University of Arizona. And most of the people in my life at that time were in the eastern half of the United States, so I kind of ruled out University of Arizona, even though my cousin was uh, a faculty member there. And then, um, and then between uh, Georgia and Vanderbilt, um, I thought Vanderbilt was going to be a place where I could do the research that I wanted to do um, a little bit better. They had a medical school on campus, whereas, uh, which was important um, for my work, uh, whereas at Georgia, it, the medical school was in Atlanta and it would have been a bit of a schlep. So I decided to go to Vanderbilt. What was it like starting to teach? You had been educated for so long. What was it like reversing the roles? Yeah, yeah. I I, always, I say to people, I've been in school all my life. I love school. You know, I just I switch roles exactly. You know, I've never left. I went straight. You know, most people don't do that now. I went uh, high school, college, graduate school, job. Uh, didn't ever do. I've never done anything else. I'd be like a disaster <laughs> if I had to get out of uh, some sort of an academic setting. I think, but. Um, it was, you know, when I started uh, being a professor, I was 27 years old, uh, and some of the graduate students were, you know, young. Uh, so it was a little challenging at first uh, for me to realize, you know, I was a professor and I'm not that I'd be friends with these people and we're the same age, but yet, you know, I had to learn fairly quickly that, um, you know, even if you're the same age or you're close to the age, you know, you're the one that, you know, has power. You know, you're determining grades. You know, you're writing letters of recommendation. So, I had it took me a few years to adjust to the role of of get you know switching to the other side. Yeah. And how did your psychology background help you teach effectively and be a better teacher? Mm -hmm. Since you kind of know mm -hmm. how people function. Well, you know, I think one of the things that helped me be a better teacher, I think, is Arno Wittig. You know, the very first thing I took, you know, in uh, in uh, high school, really, a psychology, a college class. He is such a good teacher. Uh, I'm sure he won teaching awards here. And that stayed with me, you know, like the dynamic, you know, to be a good teacher, you've got to be dynamic, enthusiastic. You've got to clearly communicate what it is that you're talking about. You've got to use good examples. So, so that I think really, you know, and I had other great, you know, uh, teachers at Ball State, better teachers, I think, at Ball State than I had in graduate school, um, uh, helped me. You know, when I when I thought about how to be a teacher, those experiences really shaped the kind of professor I wanted to be. Now, I I did have good professors at graduate school who taught me how to teach at the at the graduate level and how to organize a course and how to manage a course. All those things I learned in graduate school. But the actual teaching itself, I think I learned uh, even re kind of regardless of the subject matter uh, from some of the, the the professors I had here. And you taught what I thought was most fascinating. You taught undergraduate psychology honor students at Vanderbilt. So I'd love to kind of take some time to compare mm -hmm. the honor students at Vanderbilt to Ball State and those mm -hmm. different programs. So what were some of the similarities that you noticed within honors programs at Vanderbilt and Ball State? The students were, you know, I mean, I, I'm talking about myself, so the students were outstanding. <laughs> but uh, you know, the students at the honors program at Vanderbilt were uh, very good, and the students in the honors program here are very good. You're, you don't get into the honors program if you're very good. So, and all of the students are really excited about learning, and that was true at, at both places. 
I don't know that the uh, honor students at Vanderbilt, I don't think they had a, a, like a program like the honors college is here. Um, there were honors classes, um, so uh, it's too bad because I think the honors college, the curriculum, the core curriculum for the honors college here is such a big part of what makes it successful. Um, but the, the, the quality of the students, I think, were, were great at both places. And why do you want to teach honors? I think, I don't know if I wanted to, I think somebody asked me, would you? And I said, sure, because I had this great experience of, you know, being an honor student. And, um, and I thought that would be a nice way to, you know, teach some smaller classes, not just large uh, lecture classes, and they were smaller classes. And what values did Vanderbilt's honors students um, portray? Were they the similar values at Ball State where critical thinking, independent study and research, those kind of same foundational values? Yeah, because I don't know the whole program at Vanderbilt. I, certainly mm -hmm. what I tried to instill, and in, in, even in a non-honors class, but in, in the seminars, the smaller honors classes I would teach, I would certainly try to do that. And we did a lot of writing um, in, uh, in those uh, classes that I taught. And we would read pretty widely, too. So I would do a, a seminar in mental illness, um, and we would watch films, uh, we would read uh, a novel, uh, and we would read psychological uh, literature. So I think the foundational experience I had here helped me uh, kind of shape the way I wanted that class to be there. Okay. And in 1994, you tied the knot with Angela Hawk, and in 2014, following the U.S. Supreme mm -hmm. Court ruling in 2013, upholding the lower, lower court ruling that the proposition banning same-sex marriage in California was un unconstitutional. So can you talk about this and what it was finally like to be able to tie the knot officially in 2014? And then, mm -hmm. but before that, <laughs> I'd love to learn how you met her. Uh, we met in uh, Nashville. Uh, she was uh, living in a smaller town uh, just south of there uh, called Murfreesboro. It's where Middle Tennessee State University is, which is a comparable school to Ball State, I think. Um, and uh, so she just happened to be in uh, Nashville, and um, so we had mutual friends who introduced us uh, in uh, Nashville, and the rest is, you know, 25 years later, uh, history. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we were uh, in, met in Nashville and were together, and then, uh, I know you're gonna get to this, but then, you know, it was a big ask of her to move across the country when I left uh, Vanderbilt um, and moved in 1999 to, uh, to California, um, so. But it was great, you know, in, in 2014, I think, um, to actually officially, uh, you know, be uh, married and uh, legally married. Um, and, and we did that on our uh, 20th anniversary. So that was, that was fun, had a big party. Um, so we didn't like register or do any of that stuff because, you know, we've, we felt like we'd been married uh, for that many years anyway, but it was nice to officially have it sealed. And yeah. what does she do? Uh, she is a uh, just uh, retired uh, lieutenant uh, for the city of Berkeley Police Department. Uh, so she uh, did that uh, once we moved to California. Be when in Tennessee, she worked. Um, she had her own business um, and uh, worked at an outdoor store. Worked for the National Park Service. But when we moved to California, uh, she uh, became a police officer with the city of Berkeley and made her way through the ranks and retired as a lieutenant. And in 1995 to 1998, you were the executive council member of an emotion research group, mm -hmm. which was a professional affiliation. Can you talk about this experience? So that was a group that was developed um, uh, because there was a professional society at the time, it was called the International Society for Research on Emotion, or ISRI, that wouldn't allow uh, younger professors to join. You had to kind of be more established in your career. So there were at the time a bunch of younger professors um, who were studying emotion, which is a big part of what I do in my career as well, who said, well, that's not right. <laughs> we'll make our own group. Uh, and so I was invited to uh, be a part of this inaugural group um, and then became involved in the leadership of that group. And it, you know, it, it persisted for many years um, as, a, as a place for people early in their careers to come and talk about their research. But, uh, in a very different setting. It wasn't a formal meeting um, with PowerPoints. It was a, we would meet in the morning and talk about our research ideas and then we would go for a long hike. So it was like a small uh, group, um, but the people that were in that group um, are still uh, professional collaborators and colleagues and some of my uh, greatest friends um, today that I met in that uh, particular group. So that was a very foundational professional group um, that also had a big social aspect to it. 
1998, you moved up to be an associate professor at Vanderbilt University. What did, your, what did you learn from your students? What did they teach you in return? Um, they taught me, uh, I think, all along the way about how to be a better mentor of graduate students and how to be a better uh, instructor. How to in I, I did a lot of um, mentoring of honors uh, uh, theses at Vanderbilt, um, so I kind of uh, think they taught me that the honors students at uh, Vanderbilt and the honors theses, um, they were really also performing at the level of a graduate student, um, which was, um, you know, I, I should have realized that. I think I don't think I did initially. They're undergraduates, they're not graduate students, but they were that good, yeah. And in 1999, you're the assistant professor at University of California, Berkeley. So why did you make this move? Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I was contacted by somebody at Berkeley that said, hey, we have a job in, in psychopathology or severe mental illness, and why don't you think about a, applying for it? And I was happy at Vanderbilt. It wasn't that I was unhappy at Vanderbilt, but I, um, I, uh, what, there was a particular area of social, social psychology, uh, area of psychology, social psychology that was missing, um, and uh, in, in Vanderbilt, and they had that at Berkeley. So I thought this would be a great department. I would really like to move there, um, and so I applied, and then I was given the job. Now I, I have, uh, for academics, will understand this. Nobody else will care, but I have the dubious distinction in my career of receiving tenure twice. Uh, so I got tenure uh, at Vanderbilt right at the time I was applying for this job at Berkeley, which was advertised as an assistant professor uh, without tenure. And so I got tenure, I got an offer at Berkeley, I called Berkeley, I said, hey, I just got tenure. They said, oh, congratulations. I said, no, I, could you give me tenure? And they said, oh, no, we, we can't do that because it was advertised as, as assistant professor. So. I got tenure at uh, Vanderbilt, left it, went to Berkeley uh, uh, for a semester, and then uh, went up for tenure again. So not something I recommend for those people wishing to go on in academics, but at least it gives me the experience of getting tenure at a private university and a public university, um, which is dubious at best. And in 1999, um, you were a member of the Institute for Personality and Social Research at U UC Berkeley. So what did you do within this group? I, I'm still a member. This is um, it's called an organized research unit at Berkeley. It's a it's a group of people from all different departments across campus that have interests in uh, personality and social research, and uh, with a particular focus on emotion and culture and social relationships, and all those things are a, a part of my research. So they have a very active colloquium series. They go to talks um, and uh, participate uh, with students that uh, um, do different projects in this. Um, uh, group, uh, so it's just a kind of another intellectual home. And in 2000, you were the associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley. What classes did you find most fascinating to teach? And before I ask that, mm -hmm. I'll preface by saying you taught um, mm -hmm. classes within mood disorders and specialty clinic and clinical supervision, introduction to the profession of psychology, just so many different topics. So again, what classes did you find most fascinating to teach? Uh, well, I've always taught an undergraduate class in um, clinical psychology or abnormal psychology and severe mental illness, and, and now I even write a textbook in that area, so I always love uh, teaching that class. And at the graduate level, uh, some of the things that you were talking about, those are graduate uh, classes. So we, um, in the clinical science area at Berkeley, uh, we have a model of training uh, our PhD students um, how to do therapy, um, and we do that in a way that's very tied to research, so those are called specialty clinics. Um, so. Uh, in these specialty clinics, we uh, think about a topic that is of interest, whether it's in mood disorders, that was one that we did, or whether it's in helping people understand their feelings a little bit better, and that really uh, transcends different diagnostic categories. So those are really a lot of fun to teach because we work hard to integrate doing therapy, learning how to do therapy with the research on a particular topic, um, and that's, a, that's kind of a challenging uh, thing to pull off. Which are the most difficult um, do you think classes for students to really understand are some concepts that are really difficult to grasp? Uh, in, you mean that I teach or just in general? Yes, uh, that you teach. Um, sometimes neuroscience, I think. Uh, the neuroscience, uh, the technology uh, has changed so much in neuroscience and genetics. So uh, in, when I teach graduate level classes and even undergraduate level classes in, um, in severe mental illness, 
um, so much of what we know about mental illness now is about the brain and, and genes and getting people to understand those concepts. Sometimes people take psychology because they don't want to take biology or they don't want to know anything about the brain. You know, like I want psychology, that's like easy, you know, and then they like, oh, what the heck? What is dopamine? You know, like, are you kidding me? I have to understand the striatum. That doesn't make, you know, so those uh, concepts I think are a little bit hard. And how do you break down the modern stigma around mental illness through your classes? Uh, well, it's front and center in everything because I think it's still a, you know, one of the things that drew me to the study of schizophrenia in the first place, I think, is just they're some of the most courageous people I've ever met in my life. And they not only have this really severe mental illness, but they have other people who treat them worse than almost any other person. Uh, mental illness is one of the most stigmatized things in our society and, and still okay, I should say, in quotes, for people to do that. We just don't treat people with mental illness very well. So I talk a lot about stigma uh, at the beginning of class and throughout all classes. How, you know, how might this increase uh, stigma? How might we work to decrease stigma? How can we um, understand what is and isn't stigmatizing? So it's an important part of everything that I, I try to teach. And in 2006, mm -hmm. you got the award for the Joseph P. Zubbin Memorial Award, which was an award to recognize mm -hmm. outstanding contributions to psychopathology research at an early stage of career. So what outstanding contributions are they referring to? What did you add to the psychological field? Um, I think it was the, uh, for the research in, in schizophrenia uh, that I did, um, I think uh, for years people thought that um, uh, people with schizophrenia were just had, uh, were without emotion, they didn't feel things at all, um, they just lived these vacuous lives. And one of the things that my early research showed was that that was wrong. Um, so people with schizophrenia, not all, but many uh, with schizophrenia have a particular symptom, it's called flat affect, that means that they don't uh, express emotion. Um, so they don't show any change in their face, they don't use any gestures, they may speak in a very monotone voice and, and have very poor eye contact. And that has some devastating social consequences for people with schizophrenia. But when you're interacting with someone, just imagine like we're doing this interview right now and if I had this symptom I'm describing to you, flat affect, where I wasn't looking at you or I wasn't gesturing or changing my voice, uh, it would be a horrifically boring interview um, and uh, no one would ever watch it. Uh, and, and, but what we found out in, in my work in, in people with schizophrenia, they don't show these outward expressions, but they feel things very strongly. So you may tell a funny joke and uh, most people would laugh and somebody with schizophrenia might say, well, that was very funny, but not laugh. And you're like, well, come on, you gotta give me something. But they just don't show it outwardly, but they feel it. Uh, strongly, uh, uh, they'll report feeling strong emotions, they show it in their body, we, with the psychophysiology measures that we do, and they show it in the brain when we, we do brain imaging. Um, so uh, emotion is there, um, it's just that they have trouble outwardly uh, showing it. Uh, so that was, I think, what, what led to that uh, award. And how did you conduct that research without going too technical, because mm -hmm. most of us probably won't understand yeah. the great depth of work you do, mm -hmm. but how did you um, obtain all that research? We do it in a number of ways. So we'll, uh, we do these, uh, again, laboratory experiments with people with and without schizophrenia. So we bring people into our lab and we show them emotionally evocative things, show them short film clips, uh, show them pictures, uh, present them with uh, foods that are, you know, and, and, and then w in all these domains, they're either uh, positive things like pictures of puppies, oh, isn't that cute, or, or um, kind of negative things like a picture of somebody getting a dental, you know, shot, um, or neutral things like a picture of a fire hydrant or short films or foods like uh, something that, you know, salty cottage cheese ugh, or uh, a you know, hot fudge sundae, you know, so we just vary the, the valence, the positive, if it's positive, negative, or neutral, and then we uh, have people engage with this. We videotape <laughs> their uh, facial expressions and we code them. Um, we put electrodes all over the body and we measure what's happening in the body. We ask people to tell us how they feel. And then in some of these instances, we'll do uh, put people in a um, uh, MRI machine and take a look at what's happening in the brain. And then we analyze all that stuff and what we see is that people, um, a report feeling strong emotions, positive and negative, just like you or I would. Um, and their brain shows activity in areas of the brain um, that are associated with emotion in just the same way as people without schizophrenia. It's just that they don't outwardly show very many uh, facial expressions. They're just pretty flat. That's fascinating. 
and in 2008 you're the professor at the University of California Berkeley so as a professor what kind of student do you want to form and how do you instill a student to be just as excited about learning as you were when you were in the Honors College and throughout your entire education? Well, um, for graduate students, you know, I try to, you know, uh, graduate school is hard and uh, career and research is hard, so I try to get them to latch on to something, a problem that's really interesting. You know, you want to study something, you know, because there's long hours in a lab, long hours writing, sometimes your papers aren't accepted for publication. Um, so you want to really be intrigued by a, a problem. You want to understand, I, for me, it's like trying to understand what's gone wrong in, in schizophrenia and how can we fix it. Um, so, so getting, you know, your hands on a problem that is really interesting to you, that keeps you up at night. Um, and for undergraduates, um, I, I also try to uh, instill in them the excitement for learning and learning new things. And I do that you know, through teaching and different opportunities for them to learn, to get involved in research. Um, for everybody, no matter if it's an undergraduate or graduate student, I tell them to read uh, broadly and not just in your field. So I tell them, read novels. You know, it'll make you a better writer. Um, so I, I, always, I still uh, emphasize reading and writing, which was so much of you know, my experience here. Um, uh, if you're going to be a psychologist, you're going to have to write whether you want to or not. So you start early and start often. So, and reading uh, a lot is uh, and outside of a, a field is going to make you a better writer. And at the University of California, Berkeley, I know you, you were the undergraduate psychology honors student advising, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. was the honors, was that a program or classes like it was at Vanderbilt? Um, and it was just a thesis. So I was just the advisor for the honors thesis. We do have an honors uh, program in psychology. At Berkeley there's not an honors college either. There's just an honors program within psychology where students take a year-long uh, seminar and as part of that they do their thesis. So I've been a, an advisor for the honors theses. Okay, can you compare um, being advisor for an honors thesis versus a non-honors? What are the differences or what's the difference between one who would want to mm -hmm. pursue that honors thesis versus not? The honors thesis usually is just somebody wants to spend, uh, they, they the requirements are different. So there are plenty of people who work in, in my lab who do research, um, but an honors thesis, you have to really uh, grapple with a, a, an entire project. You may collect your own data, or you may work on data we've already collected, but you've got to write up a paper as if you were going to submit it for publication. Um, so you have to learn about the background literature. You have to uh, posit some hypotheses. You have to test those hypotheses. You have to analyze your findings and, and, and write it all up. Uh, so that's what the honors thesis is, whereas other people who work and get research experience but don't do a thesis, they can do coding, they can do some parts of data analysis, they can you know, participate in the research process, they don't just do the whole uh, thing, they don't write a thesis um, that includes every aspect of research. And you just do so much research. I don't know, how do you manage that? I mean, you're a professor and you're in all these professional affiliations, and how do you manage to just keep finding these great pieces of research that contribute to your field? Well, part of it, I do it in collaboration, you know, with great graduate students, you know, so graduate students are a big part of, I think, a professor's life and helping you, uh, you know, kind of think about things in a different way, you know, uh, so we have great, uh, I have great graduate students at Berkeley, I had great graduate students at Vanderbilt, we work together and collaboratively to think about what, here's a problem, how can we tackle it, and some student will say, well, why don't we try this? Okay, let's, you know, try that, so it's really, I think, the, what drives the research, um, is as much the people that work uh, with me, um, the graduate students, the other professors that I collaborate uh, with at different institutions as much as it, as it is me personally. Now education has changed so much, so can you compare from mentoring grad students to being mm -hmm. a grad student yourself and seeing grad students, what's the difference between a student then and student now? What are, are the motivations mm -hmm. different or the different interests? I don't know if the motivations or interests are different. The bar has certainly risen, though. So just to get into graduate school now, um, you know, if I applied now what, with what I had, you know, before, I don't know if I would have got in. So now the expectations for getting into graduate school are are so much uh, too much, in my opinion. Uh, high, you know. Sometimes faculty say, "Well, they don't they don't have a publication yet." And I'm thinking, for God's sake, you know, they're not even graduate school. We shouldn't expect them to have publications. So. Uh, so that's, you know, I think, you know, getting into graduate school is just much more difficult now. You have to be much more sophisticated. I, I went to a graduate school because so I wanted to move out of Indiana. That would never happen today. You have to have a really detailed statement about why you want to go here and what you want to do. 
um, undergraduate education has changed you know, a tremendous amount. Now when I teach an undergraduate class, um, I, uh, you know, we have a website uh, for the class. I have to post my slides you know, before the class meets. Uh, we uh, podcast and screencast my lectures uh, so people can watch them after the fact. Um, uh, I, you know, I have to you know, give uh, out sample questions for exams. You know, like I feel like I'm, you know, I'm making it so easy for people now, which is, was not the case uh, when I was uh, in student. There, were, there was no such thing as PowerPoint. You know, like there, were, there were no slides. There were transparencies or something. And I just had to take notes you know, and, and ask questions and go to office hours. Now we, it's, uh, we provide a lot more scaffolding, I think, for students. Yeah. And you expressed the importance of writing and how it's made you so much better in the career world, but how it may be that importance of writing may be lacking now as students don't write as much as they did before. Mm -hmm. So what other things do you see are missing? Or if you had the power mm -hmm. to change education, the mm -hmm. whole system, mm -hmm. what would be some things that you would implement? Well, uh, I mean, at Berkeley, you know, it's a huge uh, campus, and we have a huge number of psychology majors, so most of the classes we teach are large lecture classes. So we have these large lecture classes, and we have small, what we call discussion sections. So students meet in groups of 20 um, once a week, but with a graduate assistant, um, not with a professor. So if I could change things, it would be for us to be able to offer smaller, more smaller seminar uh, classes. We just uh, can't do it. There's too much demand for the classes, so there are these big ones, and I think that would be having the uh, you know more smaller classes because that's really where um, you have the opportunity to interact with a professor and and have that discussion um, that we just can't do right now. And you've been invited to so many lectures and workshops and papers. So how did the honors college and other experiences throughout your career morph you into a really excellent, compelling communicator? Um, well, again, I think you know the amount of writing you know that I did certainly has helped. Uh, you know, to be a good writer, you've got to be a, a clear thinker. And learning how to think and write that started here has continued throughout my uh, career. I think, and the opportunities for leadership that I had on this campus um, have uh, kind of set the stage for leadership. I'm a department chair now that um, that I never would have probably, you know, had the opportunity to do had I not had those early foundational experiences. You spoke in Germany. Can you talk about what you talked about there and where you talked about, or where you talked? Uh, you know, I don't remember. Uh, I mean, I've talked uh, in many places around the world. I'm in, uh, I remember being in Switzerland most recently, um, and uh, I, I remember now Germany, right? Uh, I mean, I'm just usually talking about my research. Um, so. Uh, people will invite me to talk about you know the research that I do in schizophrenia, so I'm sure that's what I was talking about. What's it like to travel and just explain the research that you're so passionate about to all these different groups of people from it's, all over the world? It's one of the best you know things about the job, really, to be able to travel. In fact, sometimes you have to, you know, uh, moderate it a bit. You know, <laughs> can you can travel too much? You know, you can only miss so many classes, um, and so. But it's really fantastic to have the opportunity to <clears throat> travel so uh, broadly. You know. Uh, Somebody who grew up in Indianapolis, I never would have imagined I would have been invited to, you know, go to China or to Switzerland. You know, I think it's uh, it's fantastic. And in 2008 to 2011, you were involved in the International Society for Research on Emotions. Can you describe some of your research here? Uh, so that was that group I told you about earlier, uh, ISRI, that um, that uh, kind of uh, blocked the uh, the young people in the field out of it, so we created our own group. So they, after we did that, um, that group opened up and they let younger people in. Uh, so as a part of that group, um, I would always just do what I could to encourage uh, younger people uh, in their careers and make sure that younger people um, had the opportunity to present their research and have their voice heard. Okay, and then in March in 2008, you were involved in the cognitive neuroscience treatment research to improve cognition mm -hmm. in schizophrenia. <laughs> so, what was this experience like? So that was a um, that was a, a federally funded group to try to take what we know about the brain and emotion um, and translate it into uh, better ways of assessing uh, and ultimately treating uh, schizophrenia. So that group helped to develop a battery of tests that uh, everybody will use the same kind of battery of tests to identify problems in thinking and uh, feeling um, so uh, that the field can work to collectively together to develop new treatments. What is your ultimate end goal? What do you hope to achieve with schizophrenia treatment and research? 
Well, I've spent you know probably 20 years trying to identify what the problems are and some of the emotion uh, problems in schizophrenia, and so now um, we're trying to develop some treatments uh, to try to help those things. So my ultimate goal would be we've discovered a problem. We're pretty sure we know what you know has gone wrong, uh, and now I want to try to fix it. Um, so that's what we're in in the middle of doing right now. And why are you? I know you had ties all the way back from grad school and your internship, but. Why else are you specifically interested in this disorder? I, you know, it's just because it's um, it's one of the it's a puzzle that has continued to capture my interest and imagination, and I just don't feel like I've fully um, accomplished. Uh, you know, there are too many questions that are are I haven't fully accomplished what I want to because there are too many questions that remain unanswered. Um, so I've done research in other areas besides uh, schizophrenia and some in, in depression and, and autism and social anxiety, but this has always been the kind of driving uh, focus of, of what I'm interested in. And you also earned an award for the Distinguished Teaching Award in 2006 to 2007 in the Division of Social Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. What was receiving this award like? It was great. Uh, it, that was primarily for undergraduate teaching, so it was a tremendous uh, honor to be recognized you know, by the, the division um, uh, in the college at, at UC Berkeley for, for being a, a great undergraduate teacher because it's something that I take seriously and I work on and try to um, you know, uh, tinker with my classes every time I offer them. And what do you think makes a truly great teacher? Um, <clears throat> Well, somebody who's enthusiastic and engaged and really cares about uh, the topic, which I care about mental illness, um, and who can communicate it clearly and instill excitement about the topic. Um, so many people are you know, naturally interested in mental illness because they're like, oh, maybe I have that or maybe my friend has that. But, you know, but then to really understand it and then understand um, the challenges that people with the uh, illness face and to work on lowering the stigma um, I mean, all of those things, I think, uh, are something that students really uh, can relate to and understand, and uh, I think that helps, um, at least I hope it does, um, make for a, a great experience for the students. Um, one of the things I, I do in, in my classes that I think students appreciate also is, um, and, and part of this came from my time at Ball State, actually. I had many classes that had cumulative final exams. And I hated it. I hated it. It was so hard, you know, to study like a whole semester. Are you kidding? A whole quarter for me. And so I never offer cumulative final exams. I just, uh, I never, I never liked them as a student. I'm not doing that to you. Um, and then I also, um, I give a lot of exams because uh, the classes where you have to, you basically have two exams in a whole semester. You know, you blow one, you're, you're doomed. So. I give more exams and I let them drop their lowest score. Um, so I'm trying to, you know, give people the opportunity to su su succeed and um, and not repeat the things that I didn't like when I was a student. And in 2012, you worked out with the National Cancer Institute um, doing a workshop mm -hmm. on affect and stress. So can you describe this experience and um, specifically with the biobehavioral and psychological mm -hmm. sciences? So that was, um, the National Cancer Institute was very interested in incorporating um, research on emotion um, uh, uh, as part of their um, uh, way of thinking about ways we can help uh, people with cancer, people who, are, who, who have cancer, uh, are their predictors of cancer, people who are certainly going through it, uh, which is an emotionally turbulent thing. What can we understand about emotion research that would help in all the research that the National uh, Cancer Institute funds? So it was a workshop, uh, kind of a, a, a day-long event where people from like me who do research in emotion would present um, and then they had other people who do research in cancer and we really were you know these two groups of people weren't necessarily talking to each other so we were uh, came come up with ways where what we know about emotion is enormously helpful for the people who do work in cancer and the people who do work in cancer this is a great um, area for people who do work in emotion to really um, try to invest some of their research time and in 2013, you were the president and um, just highly involved in the Society for Research in Psychopathology. So can you talk about these leadership roles and what mm -hmm. you did here? Uh, so that's a, a group, a national uh, group um, for researchers in mental illness or psychopathology and something I began going to when I was a graduate student. So it's a, it's a group that's been near and dear to my heart uh, ever since I was a graduate student. So. Um, it was a tremendous honor to be elected president of the society. So I was able to just, uh, you know, give a, a presidential address at the meeting and work with a great team of 
other uh, people on the executive board to uh, make some uh, changes in the society. Um, and, and one of the things that I, I did was try to make it a more open uh, society. Again, this dates back to my experience early on where we were excluded from a group. I just now um, uh, see the importance of not excluding anybody, particularly people young in their careers. Um, and so uh, getting more younger uh, professors and researchers to the table is what I did uh, when I was president there. And, and, and this organization used to have a, a yearly banquet um, that was uh, something that only the more senior professors would usually go to because it was expensive and you had to pay for, so it felt exclusionary, so I just canceled it. That's awesome. So what is the importance that you see in including those younger and possibly lesser experienced people? Because that, that's the way you learn. You know, I had some opportunities that were given to me uh, starting, you know, here. I got to be involved in research in my first year in college. And, uh, and, and that's, you, you know, the younger people are the future, you know, of the field. And so if you push them away, like, you don't know enough yet, go figure it out. They'll never figure it out. So the way I think that fields and, um, and groups will succeed and, and be able to, um, you know, have some longevity and maintain what they want to do is by incorporating new people and not staying static and not staying with, you know, because, you know, we all grow and uh, grow older and, and uh, if you keep with the same group of people, the new ideas just aren't going to come in. And in 2013, you collaborated with professors from University of Maryland and University of Pennsylvania and UCLA to validate a mm -hmm. newly developed clinical rating scale for negative symptoms. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you developed this and what it is? Yes, so this was a, um, another uh, endeavor that was a collaborative endeavor to try to take the research that I and other people had done on emotion and schizophrenia and translate it into something that the field could use. So we developed together across these four sites uh, a new uh, clinical assessment tool. It's a, a clinical interview for uh, what are called the negative symptoms in schizophrenia. So earlier when I said people with schizophrenia don't show outward expression, excuse me, that's uh, called flat affect. That's one of the negative symptoms. Um, <clears throat> other negative symptoms are um, people with schizophrenia may not feel motivated to do things. They may not want to be around other people. Um, they may uh, not enjoy things in life very much. So. This uh, measure is designed to assess all of those uh, symptoms in schizophrenia. And now uh, we did this um, with over 500 people with schizophrenia, validated this measure. Now it's freely available to everyone to use and many people in the field are, are now using it. And in 2017 to 2018, you were the president of the Society for Effective Science. So what was some of the research mm -hmm. or um, activities that you did within this organization? So this is that's a fairly new group. So that when I was uh, president, it was only five years old. So it was a new group, uh, Society for Affective Science, that was started um, to, uh, because there wasn't really a professional group that was uh, broadly interested in, affect is another word for emotion, so emotion research, but that would include uh, a very strong emphasis on two things really. Uh, one, making sure this was a good place for graduate students to come and present their research and interact with um, uh, more senior people in the field. And two, uh, very interdisciplinary. So this uh, group involves psychologists and neuroscientists and political scientists and uh, lawyers. Um, so the, there's a whole thing about uh, emotion and affect in the law, uh, sociology, so all sorts of uh, different um, uh, interdisciplinary groups come and present uh, at this uh, annual, it's an annual meeting, um, so um, I was uh, part of uh, the annual meeting, uh, part of the program committee, part of the executive board, and then was um, uh, honored to be uh, selected as president for the, for the year to help continue to shape this fairly uh, new society um, uh, going forward. And in 2018, you were a fellow for the Society for Personality and Social Psychology, so again, can you explain what you did here? This is just an, uh, another honor that's, um, you know, you're, you, be, you achieve fellow status here. And so even though most of my work has been in mental illness, I have done work in, in personality and social research and, and just uh, the work that I do in emotion. So that was just something that um, I was uh, selected to become a fellow. I'm a fellow of the American uh, Association for Psychological Science. These are just kind of honors. You don't really do anything per se. It's just a recognition of the work that you've done in those areas. Since you've done so much research and so, so many other things within the field, what are some themes that you're picking up on about mental issues or just the sociological effects mm -hmm. of people toward mm -hmm. mental issues? Um, 
Yeah, you know, stigma is still there. Uh, we're doing a better job of reducing stigma. We, we thought, I think mistakenly, that educating people about mental illness would automatically reduce the stigma, and we know now that's not enough. Um, so I think there's greater awareness of uh, mental illness, particularly on college campuses. You know, anxiety and depression uh, rates have increased uh, quite a bit uh, among uh, college student uh, age. Um, uh, we've learned a lot more about stress um, and how that contributes to uh, the uh, development of these things. So all of, I think, uh, the, what we've learned um, over the past, I don't know, 25 years um, are, is a lot about uh, stigma uh, and stress and uh, increasing rates of uh, mental illness. Now you're always looking for a challenge as it's hmm. been very clear. So hmm. what's next for you? What's the next big thing? <laughs> Retirement. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, well, I'm, uh, I, I'm chair of the psychology department now, so that's been a, a pretty big uh, challenge. So I've got another year uh, to go there um, to, to, to do that. And then just really, I would like to uh, uh, really see if we can get some of the treatments that we're working on developing uh, to work uh, and, and make a difference in the lives of people with schizophrenia. I think that would be great. Um, and then I'm thinking about writing a, uh, I write a textbook now, I'm thinking about writing a different kind of a book. Um, so um, I've written you know, many, many journal articles, but I'm trying to think about uh, maybe writing a book about mental illness that people outside of the field might uh, benefit from. Can you talk more? That's fascinating. What kind of things mm -hmm. are you putting into that book? Well, one of the things I want to help dispel some of the myths about mental illness. So um, that that's uh, one of the things that I'm I'm currently thinking about. People think uh, you know people with severe mental illness are violent, you know, and uh, and they're not actually. People with schizophrenia are n not necessarily any more violent than people who don't have schizophrenia. Um, so the, those kinds of things that people with schizophrenia never get better. That was the belief I started. Uh, with uh, that's not true, you know. So that and that, it wouldn't just be about schizophrenia, but it would be about you know autism and just mental illness in, in general, just to help kind of in a in a hopefully clearly communicated way some of the myths about mental illness. And it is so cool that you started off being intimidated and not wanting to go into this mental mm -hmm. disorder realm because mm -hmm. you didn't think there was any. Right treatment and now that's exactly what you're working right. towards so your intimidation turned into motivation to find something right. so mm -hmm. can you talk about what were some of the things that made that change well i i think it was just uh kind of working for years and years on the research and learning what we were learning about what had gone wrong with emotion in in people with schizophrenia and so i think uh once i kind of learned that i thought well now you got to do something about it i wasn't expecting to really become a treatment researcher. I wasn't expecting to develop treatment, but I almost felt an obligation. You know, if you want your research to make a difference, um, you can tell people about it, sure. And I speak to families uh, and people with mental illness all the time, but if I really want to make a difference, I thought this is a way I could, I could actually do it. Can you talk about some other, you've already brought up some great points about um, your research. What are some other fascinating points um, that you've uncovered in the research realm? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, you know, we've learned a lot about the brain um, and and what goes wrong. Uh, but I think probably one of the more surprising things in schizophrenia might be we've learned a lot about what isn't um, disrupted. So we think of schizophrenia as something that is pretty devastating, and it, and it certainly can be. But there's a lot of things that aren't disrupted in schizophrenia. So like I talked about earlier, people feel things very strongly. Um, people, their brain is not just uh, completely uh, disrupted. Um, in the, uh, when people are experiencing positive and, and negative emotion, uh, the brain is working as it should be. Um, so there's some key areas uh, that are preserved in schizophrenia. All right, and now moving into the kind of reflection stage of this interview. So we're trying to recognize the change in continuity over time. So how did your psychology teachings at Ball State um, either create the foundation or still influence you into your career? Well, it definitely, uh, you know, created the foundation because once, you know, I, th I came here wanting to be in psychology thanks to that one class and then I never regretted that decision once I got here and I took more psychology classes. That really did set the, the foundation for wanting a career in psychology. I ditched the medical school idea pretty quick, uh, you know, pretty early uh, after I got here and I just, you know, got into psychology. I didn't really know what you know, my options were in psychology, but I, you know, was still fascinated by every aspect of it. Um, so that definitely um, set the stage for, for my career. Did I know that I would, you know, do schizophrenia research and, 
and uh, go to UC Berkeley? Absolutely not. But <laughs> I knew I was interested in uh, psychology and that wherever that would take me, um, I, I just wanted to get on that train and take it as far as it would go. And did how did the Honors College influence you into the person you are today? Not even academically, but just personally, as a person with different motivations and mm -hmm. um, distinct other characteristics? Well, I think it probably uh, just uh, gave me a broader perspective, uh, you know, and helped me be more open-minded. Um, so um, I think, uh, you know, everybody, you know, can become a little closed-minded, you know, depending upon where you're raised. It's not specific to Indiana. People in California are pretty closed-minded because they'll never leave California. But it gave me a broader perspective um, that I don't think I would have otherwise had. Um, and, and I think that's just a good way to live. Um, to be open-minded, um, to recognize that there are different perspectives, that people think differently than you do, and that's okay. It's not something to be afraid of, or it's not something to uh, shut down. Um, so that broad perspective and open-mindedness, um, those values, I think, the Honors College helped uh, instill, which I think is a, a good way. I wish you know more people could learn that, particularly we're in this moment right now, and in the United States where people are kind of closing ranks and, and not wanting to hear other views or other perspectives. And it's almost like we're losing our ability to be empathetic uh, uh, towards one another. And that um, you know, is, is horrible in, in my view. So having this open-minded uh, perspective where different ideas can really be talked about and, and not shunned or not be afraid of or, or that's too scary, just to talk about them, embrace them. Sure, it's scary, but we're just talking about these things here and it's good to understand these different perspectives. That, I think, that way of thinking um, is something that the Honors College definitely did. And how did the interdisciplinary classes of the Honors College give you kind of a holistic look of the world that helped you understand the world and the people in your career? Um, you know, I, it's a good question. So, I mean, it definitely got me, I, you know, if I didn't have the honors classes, I would have had, you know, psychology and computer science and very little else, you know, like I would have had some math and, but, you know, that, that's all I would have had. So by, but, but having a, the lens of history and some additional biology and, uh, you know, humanities, you know, sequence, um, I think helped me see psychology in a, in a much broader way. And since the Honors College is focused around the humanities core curriculum, and many of these are classes in which you're studying history, how much history do you um, study for your research now? Like going back and comparing mm -hmm. mental illnesses from then now, how much is that pivotal in your studies? It's, it, I include it in talks about my research. I always give a quote from um, uh, uh, Bloiler, who was a Swiss psychiatrist from 1911 who um, is describing a patient that he was interacting with, which is the ig exactly what I found in my research. So it's kind of humbling, you know, like he was observing it. I just learned how to study it in a lab, but it wasn't like I developed something new. So a lot of what we do, um, you learn, you know, from, from the past. Uh, so I, I don't do history in my work. I incorporate it. I read about it all the time. I uh, love writing about it in the textbook, you know, that I uh, write about, but I don't really do it in my work, but it it's always there, a reminder that, um, you know, what we see now, you know, in 2018, you know, even just when I started, you know, out in this field, uh, things change, you know, our views change. What we think is like a great treatment now for schizophrenia, you know, will be thought of as barbaric, you know, 50 years from now. Um, so I always have a mind uh, that, you know, that things change. and and hopefully they change for the better, but we certainly, in the case of severe mental illness, can see how things haven't changed necessarily uh, for the better. That's so cool. And how did the liberal arts education that you received through the Honors College help you to attack such complex problems like mental illness with kind of grace and skill? Um, probably the, I guess, just the, the critical thinking uh, skills, you know, and the you know, not cut, jumping to conclusions, you know, like, well, let's evaluate that possibility and what's the evidence for that and contrast it with the evidence for this rather than just to have a, a more kind of, you know, you, you state your thesis here, you know, uh, show this is in support of it, end of day. So I think it was the real critical, critical thinking skills that I learned here that helped. What do you think was the best thing that Ball State University gave you? 
a great education. Uh, taught me how to teach, I think, um, by you know having such uh, great uh, professors um, and uh, just a great foundation for the rest of you know the career. I don't know what career I would have had had I not come here and had I gone to IU or something, you know, like that. Uh, where I would have been, you know, another reason I chose Ball State was it wasn't this giant mass of 50,000 students, you know, where I could, you know, not just be another, um, you know, face in an empty sea of people. Um, so uh, I think because I, I came here, I got far more uh, interaction, the, the possibility for much more interaction with professors that made me think, you know, at some level, even though I hadn't envisioned myself being a professor at the time, that being a professor is really a, a great, you know, thing to do. It's a great, uh, avocation and something that is, um, you know, going to be a, a great career. And I liked how you mentioned just the smaller school gives you a more sense of a tighter knit community. Is that really what you felt here at Ball State, where the whole university, not mm -hmm. just different departments, was kind of intertwined and working toward I did, the same goal? Definitely did, yeah, definitely. And right. how did that? How did Ball State show that to you? Uh, I just knew, I mean, from living, I stayed in the dorm for three years before I moved out, you know, so I knew people who had all sorts of different majors, so I knew what was going on, and I was involved in different, you know, groups that involved students from all different majors, so I just was exposed to um, students doing all sorts of different things. I wasn't just stuck, you know, with a, a group of psychology students, so I saw the campus for all that it offered. You know, I had friends in the College of Architecture um, that uh, I thought, well, that's really cool. You know, you get to design that stuff and then learning about what other uh, people did. Um, and computer science majors, you know, who were, you know, I was a minor, they were majors. You know, I just, I, I had the opportunity to interact and be friends with people in, in so many different domains on campus. It didn't feel so big. Um, and uh, like, you know, architecture, that's a thing that's, you know, way far away from what I do. And it could be seen that um, in the past, Ball State was an island community, which is a community that mm -hmm. is separate from the outside of the university community with mm -hmm. the actual Muncie community. Do you feel this was true when you were in college? Was it kind of the mm -hmm. university and the surrounding town, or did they more mesh together? That's a good question. You know, I was I I, I moved I moved downtown. Uh, you know, my senior year, and most of my time here, I did spend on campus. Um, uh, so. Yeah, so I, you know, I, for me personally, it did feel like Ball State. I was kind of like I, I was here. I wasn't in the in the broader Muncie area. And how have you grown? I know that is a loaded question, but from going through the Honors College in Ball State and to your graduate school and now your career, in what ways have you really grown into the person that you wanted to become? Well, that's a good question. I guess. You know, just the, uh, I mean, it's partly uh, confounded by the fact that I'm in, you know, a field um, uh, as a professor where uh, lifelong learning is kind of required. But I think just, I've never really given up on, you know, my love of school uh, and learning um, and the challenges that it brings. So whether it's a scientific problem, you know, I think I've really uh, embraced that and how, and I've grown, I guess I've become uh, a little bit, uh, uh, maybe more selective in, in the, you know, now I'm, I'm, oh, I'm interested in that, I'm interested in that, and I've become a little bit more uh, focused, but yet the, uh, I, I think I've, so I've been able to kind of settle in on what it is that I want to do, but just the, the lifelong learning that I started here um, has continued. Um, and uh, it's a good question. I don't think I have a better answer for that one. Sorry. Oh, that was a great answer. Mm -hmm. And since you're so into that lifelong learning, which is so great, do you think even when you go into retirement where most people would say, okay, I've had enough with learning, yeah. you're probably going to keep striving for oh, something. Yeah. So totally. yeah. I just think that's an awesome yeah. tie as well. Yeah. Um, my next question is, what advice would you give to current honors students going through the honors program here at Ball State? In, uh, you know, enjoy it even if you're you know like a computer science major and you're taking humanities and you're kind of rolling your eyes you know that's going to be good for you <laughs> so uh you know you have a unique experience here um that very few people do uh and uh even if you uh i think many students today think well you know like english what's an english major going to do or i can't make money as that or what am i taking this class for you will you are going to succeed in your career no matter what it is uh, because you're taking uh, these honors classes. So I would just say, you know, try not to roll your eyes. Why do I have to take that? Because it is uh, 
such a well-conceived program that you know even I was even though I was here forever ago uh, the kind of skills that you're going to be learning now are still going to be valuable no matter what you do. Now in order to not be boosters of the Honors College program we also want to get like a comprehensive understanding of the Honors College even the negative aspects. Mm -hmm. Was there anything negative that stands out about the Honors College or Ball State that you wanted to change while you were in college? Uh, I can't think of anything negative about the Honors College uh, for sure. I had such great academic advising too, which um, I don't know if that still happens, but that was, you know, amazing. Um, the food was horrible then, but I think that's changed. <laughs> uh, really? um, we got, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, I was still in a huge uh, sports fan and um, uh, I don't think we had to pay for any tickets to go to football or basketball games. I don't know if that's still true, but I hope that would be. Uh, true, um, because I think participating in, you know, the uh, if, if you like sports, participating and, and being fans is such a big part of the college experience. Uh, that wasn't a negative at all. I would just say if they changed it, they should change it back. Yeah. yeah. And you're clearly just, a, and you are and were very smart during your um, college years. Do you, felt, do you feel like you were challenged enough at Ball State? Was there ever a point where you're like, mm -hmm. I don't think I was probed mm -hmm. enough or challenged enough? I don't think so. No, I mean, I no, I, I don't even remember think things were easy necessarily. You know, I kind of the further I went along, I knew what I had to do, but um, but I I never took it for granted. You know, like even if I thought a class was easy, I would never I could never like say, oh, I got that. I I just was um, I think probably too driven to you know relax. You know, so I I still remember I, I drove by yesterday uh, walking. I would often study at the medical school in the medical school library. Um, largely because I like the french fries in the cafeteria there. Uh, so I would go over there and, you know, study long hours during uh, finals. Um, even if I, you know, was pretty confident I knew, you know, what the material was, I would never, yeah. So, um, so I, I think I always, uh, I always felt challenged, yeah, even though I did do well. And um, I did, uh, uh, I, my, you probably, I don't know if you saw my uh, grade point average, but I always, uh, I, got, I got all A's here except one B. Uh, and what was that class in? And that B uh, still kind of chaps me a bit. You know, it was a computer science class. It was a computer hardware. Yeah. Had a lot of physics in it. I've never never been a physics person, so 1B. Yeah. Computer well, hardware. it clearly didn't affect your success. No. Career, so. <laughs> but still, 1B. You know, it's like being 11, you know, like out of the top 10. Yeah. Just shy. And how did the Honors College in Ball State instill in you the value of hard work and constant rigor towards a goal? Well, let's, I mean, partly the, the Honors Colleges were challenging, so, and you started those early. Um, and I took, I don't know why, but I don't think it was an honors thing, but I had a philosophy class my first quarter here, um, and that was hard. You know, like I remember I got, I got a C on my first paper, and I thought, holy smoke, you know, what have I gotten into? And I ended up, you know, doing fine there, but, you know, it just, Right, maybe it was probably smart that I had a hard class right at, because it was just right at the beginning. I like, okay, this is, you got to step it up here. Um, so um, also, you know, the quarter system, which you don't have, but but I had, you know, it was great as a student. I would hate it as a professor. That's a lot of teaching, but um, but it was great because you know if there was a class that you didn't like as much, you know, it was going to be over sooner. Um, but it was also demanding. You know, you go to class four days a week for all of those classes. So part of the way that system was uh, structured, you, you had to kind of be uh, engaged. Um, you couldn't, you know, you only got one day a week off. And back then, anyway, you, you had to go to class or uh, they didn't take attendance or anything, but you, you'd really miss stuff. There was no way to make it up, really, if you weren't there. Yeah. Before we reach our last couple of questions, is there anything I left out within your career or your life that you'd like to include? Uh, I don't think so. It's pretty comprehensive. And if you could say something to your 21-year-old self, what would it be? Uh, it would be um, be grateful <laughs> for all you've learned here because that is uh, it's going to serve you well. And with that, we'll bring our interview to an end. On behalf of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project, I want to thank you, Dr. Kring, for participating in our project. Thank you for having me.